I'm just here to tell you, you won the Arctic Inspiration Prize. Congratulations. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> you folks have been doing such an amazing work. I'm just so thrilled to see what this Monday is going to do for your project. Uh, congratulations to all you and uh, all the best. Thank you very much for your submission and uh, congratulations. So on behalf of our team, I definitely always wanted to thank our nominator, Grace Southwick, who, for, who is from Kiwani First Nations. And she so strongly believes in, in our work, working with the youth, and she's worked with us in the past. And I want to thank her so much. I also would like to thank our entire team that helped us and direct us with the proposal. Uh, Frederick Blake from Northwest Territories, Frank Brown from British Columbia, Valerie Coutois from uh, our leader from the IA Indigenous Leadership Initiative in Canada, Jocelyn Jo Strack, uh, Ethel Blondin, there's, and John, John and Bath from the Northwest Territories, and with our whole hearts, we thank you so much. And Masit Cho Shalaknai, we hold you all up. Thank you. In 2020, when the Canadian Mountain Network team wrote the Arctic Inspiration Prize proposal with our former co-research director, Norma Cassie, we could only imagine the kind of meaningful experiences that land-based learning would create. Matching funds from CMN brought the total budget to 1 million, enabling a team of 16 organizers and facilitators to offer our first ever land-based learning camp in 2022. It was humbling to witness this vision turn into a reality and the positive ripples made by the connections, lessons, and stories shared. With open hearts and open minds, we are thrilled to share the story of camp with you and can't wait to offer our next program in 2023. Our indigenous knowledges are ancient. They come from our homelands. Our languages, our culture, and our ways of knowing are all connected to the earth, water, and the animals. Thousands of years our people gathered on the land. We gathered in camps where we passed down valuable hunting and survival skills where we conduct ceremonies and make important life decisions. This is where leaders are created on the land. Elders work closely with the young people, sharing their stories to pass down our knowledge and empower our youth. That is our duty. From both eyes on the land, we learn. Welcome to our story. In August 2022, 18 youth from across Canada gathered on the homelands of Kluan Man Kai in the Kowani region. With the impacts of colonization on our planet, reconciling with Mother Earth and with one another is paramount. We can build lasting partnerships between Indigenous and Western knowledge systems by working together 
the north will be much stronger. I'm hoping to learn about residential school. I initially came to this camp to learn about the traditional and scientific like projects are doing. Making connections with settler students and Indigenous students. I try to read and learn and as much as I can, but there's no substitute for the sharing of ideas between people. And I'm hoping that what I learn from others can propel me to, to act about the lands and the waters and justice. It's important to then use that care for action and not just feelings because it can it can get caught up in other things and I'm still figuring that out but this is this has been a huge help in that. I came here to learn about climate change, colonization, residential school, learn how to heal, how to strengthen your culture and um, one of my leaders that I know recommended me to come to this camp so I'm really glad for this whole whirlwind experience and what I have to offer and what I will learn. I came to be at this camp as part of the studies I'm doing right now, conservation biology. It's a good way to meet people, young people, indigenous people, and uh, talk about the ideas. Being able to deal with groups of people easier, leadership skills, bring my community together and help out people that back home that uh, don't really know what to do when it comes to our land and our culture. Something that I was interested in too because it said about climate change and I'm very interested in trying to um, help my community because it's like eroding and the water's levels are really high so I thought it would be something that that would help. Part of the reason I came to the camp was because my supervisors, Fiona and Crystal, were like, hey, this would be great for you, um, especially working with youth, because that's such a vital component of doing this kind of work. So attending the camp really provided me with the knowledge, tools, and experience I need, I think, going forward to be able to engage with youth and also just have fun at the same time. Um, not be about work all the time because it, it is work, but it's also so much more than that. Um, it's about who you are as a person and growing and that sort of thing, so. What the youth, what the participants of this camp get out is to, to feel empowered, right? To, uh, to feel that they've been heard, both by the, the researchers that came as well as the, the non-Indigenous folks. Um, and that they feel that they have a voice, right? And part of empowerment is feeling heard, and and uh, you know we've we've heard it said a few times that uh, you know to, to speak so you can be heard and to help them feel like they can do that. We connected our local knowledge holders and academics with our youth, enabling intergenerational knowledge transfer. Participants learned about community-based research methods, on the land safety, the history of colonization, and the impacts of residential schools in the north. We also explored the best practices for moving forward in a good way towards reconciliation. Colonization has altered every part of our lives as indigenous peoples, fragmented our cultures, and those social issues are what we still deal with today in our communities. History in Canada has been whitewashed, basically, you know, and not just with Indigenous people, but other people of colour and those considered different. So to really understand who we are as human beings, we have to look at the good, the bad and the ugly in our history. And, you know, we can't truly understand ourselves and who we are by ignoring parts of our history. So the racist laws towards Indigenous people have created chaos in our communities, but understanding, you know, teaching and understanding allows us to really think about everyone's history and uh, Canada's history. 
when we were talking about residential schools, I knew it was going to be. I never talked about my story before to anyone, how it affected me. And when they said we were going to talk about it, I was like, I'm not going. This is way too hard for me. I'm not ready for this. I was crying. I was breaking down crying. I was so anxious and I just couldn't stop crying because it's such a hard thing to talk about. And You know, growing up and just how Canada's made it look too is like, you know, that we were stupid people and not, you know, not as educated as the rest of the world. And I think that played a big part on you know, them really screwing us over and um, taking things that weren't theirs. I built up the courage to bring myself to the circle and I spoke my truth about my experience of intergeneration, intergenerational trauma with my grandparents, with my parents passed on to me. It opened up my mind to how strong um, our ancestors were. I just. I think it was interesting to see that history, especially Canadian history, has covered up the real truth so much. And it felt like a release of all this burden that I was carrying on myself. And it felt so good to let that out. And what I said, people cared about what I said. They listened to me and they wanted to make sure I was okay and they want me to heal. History, like especially Canadian history, has very much covered that all up. and. Um, you know, wants to cover it up because they want to have this um, image on um, freedom and, and, and love for everyone and, and healthy water and healthy land and healthy air and all these beautiful things, but then they forget, you know, the people that keep trying and, and, and did before everything happened took care of it. Coming from Alberta, in my education, um, like from kindergarten to grade 12, we didn't learn much about residential schools. Um, I mean, we learned about like the fur trade with a very um, like rosy-eyed glasses kind of thing. And um, it wasn't until university when I decided to take a Native Studies course um, with my supervisor, Crystal Fraser, that I actually learned about those things. Um, and it's only, like I'd say, in the last four or five years now um, that I've learned about those truths and been able to internalize that in my own way and see what I can do to help move forward in a good way. We bring these young people to a safe environment where they are focusing on themselves and the land. They see better, they hear better, and they feel better. In our teachings, we take a holistic approach in discussing earth, air, water, and fire. Our spiritual ways, our mentality, our emotions, and physical well-being are how we connect to the natural world. I'd say my best part about the Yukon is just meeting everybody, making so many new friends, like, and even though you're so far away from home and, like, you don't have your own people, everybody just, you're on, everybody just makes it feel like home because they make it feel like they're my own people. Like, I have, before I came here, I wasn't very open about anything. Like, I was just, I had everything bottled up inside. And like I didn't like talking about stuff, but now, now I realize that talking is better. Like I've opened up so much more since I came here. Like to people I don't even know, very like as much as I know to my people back home, and it just makes me feel so. It makes me feel at ease a lot more than I was back home because everything was just so bottled up, and I was always so stressed and so angry and just so like now I feel relieved because I got so much stuff off my chest since I got here.
Our leaders shared historical challenges and successes of indigenous peoples in Canada. True. They come through this country and lots of people were shooting sheep, caribou, moose, bear. I've seen some pictures with 26 grizzly bears. What would you do with 26 grizzly bears? It, it, they're all stretched up in front of their vehicles. So people said, not us, we didn't have no say. This is really beautiful country. We should make this a protected area. We're gonna make this as a game sanctuary so nobody can hunt and fish or do anything here. We held off on how that land was expropriated from our use, from our families for 60 years. People from Champaign came up and they were told, you can't go there. It's a game sanctuary. All of the native people, they gotta take all of your stuff and move out. My grandma Sue and them had to move out from down at Wolverine Creek on the, on the, White, on the Don Jack River. Their whole homestead, they had to just up and leave it. All of that whole area, from Cluckshoe Creek all the way down to the White River was all off limits now. I don't know what they think we are. We're otters, but I just live on fish because we couldn't go over here on the road, on that side of the road. And we only had this little strip of land and then we had 42 miles of lake. Only way we can get across the lake is, uh, is uh, winter time. We were raised up having to break the law for food. Other than that, we're gonna live on fish. Or you go to jail. Or you go to jail. They said that this is enough. They took it to court here in, uh, in the Yukon. It went all the way up to the Yukon Supreme Court and because of the Calder case, because of that Calder case that had happened in British Columbia, they recognized Kalwani people have a right to hunt, fish, trap, and gather. They do not have, you do not have a land claim settlement. They have an inherent right to this land and to the resources on this land. The youth were taught about the Canadian constitutional reform and land claims movements directly from a leader who helped bring these changes to life enshrining indigenous rights and governance systems and laying the foundation for modern treaty negotiations in this country. And their mission was land claims, land claims, land claims. That was the mantra in British Columbia for a hundred years. And Nishka successfully negotiated the first modern treaty in British Columbia and it took them 113 years. Uh, their efforts, the problems are isolation, their, more importantly, their strength. People are talking about self-government, and what does that mean? Well, in some sense, it means control of renewable natural resources. What does freedom mean? For me, it means the right to make your decisions that you can reinforce with economic power based on renewable natural resources. In other words, if you don't have access to renewable natural resources that are not siphoned down to you by welfare programs in the Department of Indian Affairs, you're still a slave. But if you can develop your own, on your own land, in your own territory, with your own people, and use your language and your cultures and your relationship to each other and the waters, now you've got a chance to be free. It still brings tears to my eyes because these guys were part of my life. These women were part of my life. They are the ones that gave me the purpose, reinforced the purpose that my mother and father gave me in order to be a fighter for the land. And a good friend of mine has a slogan, he says, it's all about the land, stupid. And that's really what it is all about. It's about the land and the resources, the sea, the mountaintops, and all the other things that we have shared uh, and sadly seen much, much destruction in. 
already we've um, really formed a strong bond between all of the participants. So it's amazing to be able to build relationships and connections with people who are from all across the country, from all different backgrounds. And learning from the elders and researchers has been so enriching. They are fountains of knowledge and wisdom. And uh, we are in the presence of really great leaders here. So hearing their stories has been very heartening for myself and wanting to create positive changes for our environment, but also for social justice and human rights. So it's been unreal. As the earth changes, we must bring our own change. Mass biodiversity loss, melting ice, floods and fires all threaten our way of life every day. In the face of this climate crisis, our northern communities recognize the urgent need for training and research that support adaptation and sustainability. A lot of historically and, and still, uh, research has largely been done by outsiders. So a big part of the work that the Canadian Mountain Network does, as well as Norma, uh, Cassie, is that it's the idea of co-production of research and uh, supporting local production of, of knowledge um, in the academic sense, as well as um, a working with land guardians and such. If you're going to research caribou, you got to research what it eats, who eats it, what all the parts are, how it migrates, where it migrates to, and all of that. We are a holistic type peoples, and our research is holistic. It's not just linear. You just don't go in there and just research one animal forever, and that's all you know. Like there's indigenous knowledge around that particular animal or species or plant. The research is also really heavily biased towards the biophysical sci natural sciences. Very little done in the social sciences. So people spent a lot of time trying to understand what the physical impacts were, but not really what's going to be the impact on people. In my experience, the, what we call the body of knowledge is hugely biased. And it doesn't have a lot of Indigenous perspective, unless someone else studied it, but then they're telling your story. People have come in here, do research, and expose it to the entire world and we never even see it. To get your PhD or to get your name in papers, to get everything like that, but it's our people's knowledge. So we have to be really careful with that as well. So I, in a lot of the work that I do is, I try to advocate for um, Indigenous peoples being able to tell their own story and say, this is actually what's happening. This is what we actually understand the problem to be. This is how we're experiencing it. What, what generally happens is people come in and they study Indigenous people, but you'll get the presentation tomorrow on what should research actually look like with Indigenous people, and it's not doing research on Indigenous people, like you're reading it, like that sort of... The theory, anyway, in terms of the direction for climate change is that it'll be Indigenous-led research. What does it look like? And as far as I can tell, nobody really knows. Science and, and Indigenous communities work together. It's not science needs can't validate indigenous knowledge I, indigenous knowledge is there it's real we need to accept it and add it to the research because it's valuable and it sometimes is more valuable than eight collars on caribou in a herd you know, people have been watching these herds for years you know hundreds of years thousands of years and we're gonna learn more in a five year study based on collaring? How researchers can um, go into communities and work and be more um, respectful and understanding of where they're working and stuff. And I said a good idea would be to like, get those community members to be working with them instead of bringing people up to work for them. Cause that's what lots of people do. And it's kind of unfair to the people that are from there because they would totally be open to a good job or something like that. I think the main takeaway then is just, I need to listen and I need to listen what communities want and that's what research needs. It's, it's listening to communities and 
kind of putting aside the species you want to work with and working with the people instead. I also think it's good too to bring other people to learn because they have never seen those certain things before. But I think there needs to be more of a mix when people are doing research in um, indigenous areas and stuff like that, just because you need to have that respect. You can't just like go there. And so many people just aren't aware of the respect you should have. My advice to researchers and like graduate students that want to do work collaboratively is that you need to look at yourself. Well, first of all, like you need to look inward and think about who you are and where you come from because that is vitally important in the work you do. Um, so that's positionality. You need to think about um, where you come from and the implications that are there because there's there are legacies of extraction and harm in community-based research. And so the history, especially in the North, is that a lot of researchers from the South come up they come and they take what they need and they leave and they do nothing for community, um, which has left a really bad reputation. And it's also caused a, a lot of real harm. Northern Indigenous communities are working to build the well-being, skills and resiliency of our young people, preparing them for this uncertain future. I can't believe some people still don't believe climate change is happening. Some people think it's not that bad. But from my own experience, I see in the whirlwind of crazy weather this winter, it went from freezing rain to snowing, to raining, to freezing cold. Very long winter, very short winter. It, and I've seen that change within my own lifetime and that's scary to think about. What my kids will see now, if it's that big for me, how big it will be for them. Um, I want my children to go off ice fishing. I want them to go hunting and be able to feel like they're safe and secure on the land. But with climate change, it's just not like that anymore. It's so fastly changing. It's un unpredictable and it, it can get you in some very scary situations like falling through the ice or not being able to hunt your favorite traditional food, not being able to learn about certain practices and traditions. As an indigenous youth, like I know for a fact that we're not gonna have our elders around forever and this is our land and we need to take care of it because we're not gonna be able to carry on with our culture much longer. Like a really big part of our culture is living on the land and if we don't have the proper space to do that, then it's just not going to really be a thing anymore. And I think that it's important for us to learn about that, especially at a young age, because we could teach it for a long time and we could like try to do better. All I got to say for our future people, I hope you try your best to try and save what you have and keep your culture going. It's going to be different. Like I grew up in my boat with my pop and my dad had to fish and you gotta have some stupid food from the store too but like because now you have limits on it like, because there is a, de a rapid decrease in a lot of animals so there's there's limits on it like you can't have your wild food as a daily meal plan it's going to come down to it in the future where like, i'm going to be having to fight for things that mother nature gives to us I feel selfish almost saying that too because, you know, there's people right now that don't have clean drinking water and don't have food and don't have well, a home or just basic human rights. I'm scared for my future because I'm going to have to fight for things that any human being in this world shouldn't fight for. Since the beginning of time, our people have always been land guardians. There is an urgent need to create more indigenous protected and conserved areas around the world. Building capacity for indigenous-led stewardship supports strong economic opportunities for our young people in the communities while they are protecting the land. 
For systems of research um, born out of universities, there's this expectation of moving from you know, planning, having predetermined processes and deliverables and outcomes, you know, asking questions and then pursuing them in a, in a methodical way. That doesn't really meet the needs of young people. We need to flip the idea of what is research, thinking of it as a journey of learning, of being emergent, of learning from the young people and what it is they need and how to create space that really serves them, reflects them, and then in turn help them, helps them to grow. And that's why something like land-based learning is so important, because it can really bring our youth from a place of uncertainty and fear into a place of like confidence and belonging and knowing their identity because as indigenous people our identity is born on the land. And I think this is important you know because Canada wants to reconcile with indigenous people and so the first thing everyone needs to do is to reconcile with mother earth. The way that they would do their like climate assessments that would cover a huge geographic area, because one of the criticisms I find of Indigenous people is that we don't have a baseline, when actually we do. So visiting is actually climate action. Like they're using their own knowledge, assessing the health of the people and environment to see what's needed for the well-being of the community. And this will affect everyone. You know, the climate change, people have to understand that no matter where you live, that eventually this is going to affect you. And even though Indigenous people feel and see it first, it doesn't stop there. So sharing knowledge, when you come here and you're sharing knowledge, that's actually climate action. Whether it's, uh, you know, traditional knowledge and Indigenous sciences coming together, so sharing knowledge and finding ways to do that is actually climate action. When you understand that it's connection between people, it's a disconnect from the land. So engaging in those kind of things build climate knowledge. Systems of prestige, of control, of being protective are serving internally. When we are wanting to love and to care for young people, we need to move that energy out externally. But unless you get them out there to see what's actually going on there, you can tell them about it, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't register the way it does when you're actually out there uh, to see it firsthand. And that's again why these camps are just so important because it's very real, and the young people are there to grow and to learn. And there is an opportunity for institutional systematic transformation that we can all learn from, reflect from, and you know, research and share the knowledge that comes from that. And that is the wonderful output of this work. As we do these camps, we are creating guardians who will dedicate themselves to protecting what we have left on the planet and sustain life going forward. When, when I got asked that question, what, when did you feel most connected to the land? I, I had trouble, to be honest. I was like, I, you know, to be honest, I can't quite pinpoint you where it happened. Like we just always were. You know, it, the, in Old Crow, the land is like right there compared to my experience in Toronto, seeing miles and miles of just cities. Well, it's just as into up in Old Crow, there are just miles and miles of mountains and trees. To be honest, I can't tell you, I just always felt connected to the land. We always were, and we always will be. I'm more so just proud to be First Nations and be Indigenous and like know that I have so much strength and there's so many First Nations kids out there that don't think they have a voice and don't understand that their voice is like one of the strongest things ever. Like we're still here. Like I'm so thankful to be Indigenous. By communicating and talking about your past experiences and things that has happened, you become stronger when you connect on those things and like, yeah, discuss it and talk about it. I just think it's so important that, yeah, there should be camps like this going on all over Canada. It was great because we got to talk about those things together in a very, like, raw way. 
which is important because you need everything on the table. Like, reconciliation is all about truth, and you need the truth out there on the table. And so for us to sit in a circle and everyone's telling stories and we're crying and we're pouring it out there was so important. And to do it in the context where, you know, 10 minutes later we go out on the land and we can breathe and feel the air, you know, and listen to the leaves and the wind and that sort of thing. And then um, just be situated in place to talk about those issues was so important. It's definitely changed the field of research I want to do. Um, it's definitely changed the location of where I want to do research. Um, yeah, meeting these kids and hearing their stories and specifically Lucas, um, I want to, I want to do something that matters. I want to start, well, not really start, but I want to speak up to try and get, I want to get, like I said, a research program on the go where we can track the salmon and what they're doing and where they're going because who knows, we might have our salmon leaving here and traveling to Greenland or overseas, who knows. The call here for funders, for decision makers, is to be open to risk and relinquishing some control in how funds are spent and how decisions are being made about them. In grassroots, community-based work, especially youth-focused work, Things change very quickly, and we need to create systems that are nimble enough to serve the needs of the young people. And we have a mutual responsibility, I think, to act respectfully to one another um, and to take care of the land together because we share this land. Um, and we have a responsibility um, on both sides, but particularly for those of us that are not Indigenous, I think a lot of us conveniently ignoring that we have this responsibility. Uh, we all need to take it upon ourselves to come to the table as an equal partner and do the background work we need to do um, to be able to move forward in a good way. When I get back to my community, I want to try to make a change. A lot of the youth in my community can't really speak our language and we've never really had a really good program in our community for language, so I want to encourage that upon our school committee and whatnot. And I also want to get like a first aid training set up. It's really important for us to know that, especially when we're on the land. And I want to set up a few programs on the land for the youth to go to, like this, similar to this one. When I'm finished um, this research camp, learning camp, I'm going away to university in my province to try to become a lawyer. And um, I want to speak with other leaders. I want to go in court. I want to fight for my indigenous people because we don't have indigenous representatives. So with this camp, I learned more about climate change. I heard the wise words of elders and I want to take what I learned and use to I'd see. So taking it from both sides so we can combine together, which is way stronger. And um, I want to help people. I want to help indigenous people and I want our voices to finally be heard. So what's our message? What, yeah, what's your message? What's your one big strong message that you got? Make sure you follow Do Lee. Do Lee is your law. Make sure you follow Do Lee. You have to know the language, you have to be on the land, or at least learn the language because you're learning a different way of thinking. People who think in the language think differently. I learned after 62 years of upfront Indian politics, you've got to be home, you've got to be on your land. That this is my guarantee to you is that uh, once you start realizing what Indigenous people have contributed to the world, you'll realize how much people live our way of life. The value of this camp was that it made me question it, question the education that I've had, and I think that thought process is, is what's important. Questioning what you're being taught and questioning the methods and, and questioning the procedures. It's like you, when you're sick, you go to the doctor and the doctor listens to you and like looks at your body and finds out what's wrong. 
Well, if the land is sick, you don't sit in a classroom in a city. You need to go to the land and listen to it and hear what's wrong. And that's why land-based learning is so important. If I had one message for you, know your country. You know, know where you come from. Know your language. And you're just, you're worth saving. You know, you're, you're braver than you think. Smarter than you know. Get on the land and you're going to figure it out.